In this episode, I am going to discuss safety cues, what they are, and how to help your clients to notice them, savor them, and hopefully grow the ability to get a bit more unstuck. My name is Justin Sinceri. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist that thinks the world needs a new paradigm for mental health. Welcome to Stuck Not Broken. This podcast is not therapy, nor is it intended to be a replacement for therapy. It's also not therapeutic consultation for my therapeers. I am going to respond to a message I got from Christian via Instagram. This is one of my international listeners. I, th- I want to say Spain, but I'm not sure. But hey there, Christian, thank you for the message. So this, this is my general thoughts to Christian and to, well, to you listening. But there could be plenty of stipulations and times when this is not accurate. Fine. This is general thoughts for general situations. Christian uh, says, how do you teach clients about safety cues so they don't depend on them? I'm thinking about someone who may be afraid to leave the house alone, but who discovers that leaving with someone regulates his or her nervous system. So the first thing is, let's talk about what safety cues are. Just a quick recap. If you're not familiar with the polyvagal theory, go to justinlmft.com. I have all kinds of polyvagal resources plus or or. Uh, episode 101 of this podcast, 101 through 109, is a deep dive into the polyvagal theory. So you definitely need to know that before moving on. But safety cues as part of the polyvagal theory are basically what provides a neuroception of safety to our autonomic nervous system through the brainstem. This is different for everybody. What, what's a cue of safety for me versus a cue of safety for somebody else could be wildly different. I love the smell of oranges. That's a very much a cue of safety for me that helps ground me in my nervous system. Lemons too, I guess like citrusy kind of things. I like the smell of it. But this could be very much different from myself to the next person to the next person based on all kinds of factors. Um, individual histories, probably the maybe the biggest one that what's a cue of safety for me could actually be a cue of danger for somebody else based on the context of something that they went through. However, there could also be universal cues of safety that apply to all of us human beings. Not necessarily exactly the same cue for all of us, obviously, but typically things like gentle eye contact and vocal prosody, these are going to be cues of safety for all of us. We might feel uncomfortable at receiving these cues of safety, but they will be received as a cue of safety, but then experienced Maybe that's discomfort if we're not used to being in our safety state. What I want to take this to, though, is to ask when it comes to potentially being dependent upon safety cues, which which I'm going to talk about more in depth later on. When it comes to this, is it a safety cue or is it a protective cue? I guess I'll call it that. A safety cue will bring you feelings of safety. It'll shift you up your polyvagal ladder into your state of safety and social engagement. A protective cue keeps you in defense, but it might bring a sense of protection. Uh, I wouldn't call it relief, maybe relief, but I don't think that's quite the right word for it. A protective cue maybe diminishes the intensity of your defensive state, but you still stay in the defensive state. That's different than safety. So if someone is having difficulty leaving the the house, they might feel protected with somebody else, but that doesn't mean they're actually accessing their safety state. That's a that's a big difference. And the processing of that, the talking like when someone notices what brings them to safety in therapy, talking that out is gonna be a big part of identifying what actually brings you to safety. I'm gonna talk about that later on as well. So The safety cue dependency uh, wording, I found that interesting. That's something I wanted to kind of delve into a bit more. So I'm going to take this off in my own direction here, and then I'll bring it back to what Christian was asking. Do we become, well, the way where I want to take this is, do we become dependent on safety cues? And if we do, so what? They're safety cues, right? Like, what does it matter? And I guess where it matters is, is if it's a safety cue and that other person is your safety cue, then we might be using them for our own benefit? Question mark? Kind of benefit? Pseudo benefit? 
So we might be utilizing someone. We might, might be using them as a tool. And that does not go along with being in your safe and social state, in my opinion. If you're in your safe and social state, I don't think you're actually going to be utilizing somebody else as a tool so that you can leave the house. That's going to come from desperation, of course. That's going to come from wanting, needing to minimize the amount of pain you're in. That's going to come from needing to be functional. Absolutely. But at some point, that may be done at somebody else's expense. And I can see that being a problem. So if that dysregulated person is not considerate, they, and that's just one scenario, but there could easily be scenarios where that person becomes manipulative of another person in order to feel what seems like safety or relief or protection. That could easily become a problem at that point. But I wouldn't really call that a safety cue. To me, that is a diminishing of defensive energy, which is something, but I wouldn't call it a safety cue. I mentioned earlier I like the smell of oranges. Well, how about that? Could I become dependent on the smell of an orange in order to self-regulate, to climb my, the top of my polyvagal ladder and feel safety? And if so, so what? Who cares? And I, I could see, you know, maybe if it becomes like an addiction or something like that, maybe if that's interfering with my basic functioning, at that point it becomes a problem, sure. Like if I'm in a therapy session and I have to like leave and go sniff an orange in order to come back into the therapy room and be effective, yeah, I, I could see that being a problem, sure. But what if we're just using safety cues to self-regulate? Isn't that kind of the whole point of uh, safety cues, uh, at least self-regulative safety cues, the ones that we kind of have some control over. Those, you know, things that anchor us in our safety system. That's, that's the point, right, is, is to feel safety. So, so what? Like, what else would you do besides utilizing some sort of safety cue or safety anchor? What else would you be utilizing in order to get to your safe and social state? These external cues are for our senses. So the smell of an orange, that I utilize my sense of smell in order to ground myself. The, the, a visual of uh, nature, a lot of times I'll, in therapy I'll have a screen with a picture of nature in it, uh, just that I find on YouTube, and, and that seems to be, that helps ground people. So it's a safety cue for my clients, yeah. And they, they use their senses in order to in order to climb the top of the ladder to safety. That's self-regulation, right? Isn't that a good thing? Or we can even use like top-down internal cues, like telling us, telling ourselves that we're, hey, we're amazing, we can handle whatever situation is, it is, or uh, doing some sort of cognitive reframe. So we can do top-down cues to regulate as well. And that's kind of a safety cue. I don't, I don't personally see an issue with that. Now, if we do these things, is that becoming dependent upon it? I don't necessarily think it is. The issue for me is, are we building our self-regulation or not? If we do these things, if we turn to these things, if we have a menu of options but that brings us to safety and we utilize what's on our menu, which I think is a really good idea, is it building our self-regulation or not? Are we building up our independence, our ability to self-regulate or not? Are we actually building up our distress tolerance? We all need safety cues. This is very normal. We're all going to utilize these external and internal safety cues. That's, that's not an issue. But are you actually building up your capacity to tolerate more distress? and to self-regulate. That's, that's what it comes down to. And the way you might measure this or something you could ask yourself or think about when you think about your clients for my therapies, it's an issue of, is it, it might be an issue of, I need to feel better versus my autonomic nervous system needs more regulation. I think there's a different flavor in those two statements. I need to feel better my autonomic nervous system needs more regulation. I need to feel better. That can easily turn into addiction or relief seeking or protection seeking. That can turn into those situations where 
your basic functioning is at risk or you're eventually unwittingly even manipulating somebody else as a tool for your own feelings of protection. This is, I, I compare this to like a medicinal kind of mindset that we are reliant on a safety cue as a dose of medicine or we are reliant upon experts to tell us what to do to feel better, to make the feelings go away. I need to feel better. Make this stop. Make this go away. And we know from polyvagal theory that story follows state. So that means that the thoughts in our mind follow the state that we are in, in our autonomic nervous system. And that I need to feel better. That can have a very panicky kind of flavor. I think that could probably fall into any of the defensive states on the polyvagal ladder. But my mind goes to like a more of a panicky, like I need to make this go away. I need to make this stop. Now, if we're utilizing safety cues at, at, at that point, not necessarily bad, but I could see that becoming a dependence. But at that point, it's used more as a coping skill, maybe. But it doesn't sound like genuine self-regulation building. Compared to my autonomic nervous system needs more regulation that to me it has more of an element of mindfulness like you're aware of the somatic piece of yourself part of yourself not that it's different but uh, as distinct from your conscious awareness you're able to witness your somatic needs you're able to notice that your thinking self may be out of misalignment with your somatic self and that these things need to align come back to baseline, come back to the present moment. So my autonomic nervous system needs more regulation. I think it's more of just like an, it's an accurate description of what's happening rather than I need to make this stop, make it stop. Uh, but the problem, the trick here is that you kind of have to have some safety activated already in order to have that level of mindfulness. So that's kind of the catch there. So this again, brings me back to what I asked before, which is, are we building self-regulation or not? Safety cues are not an antidote to make def defensive feelings go away. That's not what it's about. That's just maybe coping at best. That's just dealing with the moment and getting through the moment. And that's not bad. I'm not knocking people for that at all. You do what you got to do to get to the moment. But... We want to build the capacity to self-regulate, ideally. So we build safety. We, we build it. It's not something we turn on by smelling an orange. I mean, it is in that moment, can be grounding. But does that help you to build self-regulation overall? We build safety. We don't just turn it on. Building Safety Anchor is my course that's designed to build safety over time. I do have a 30-day option and a self-paced option. But the, the, the idea here is to identify what brings you to safety and not just identify what brings you there, but to incorporate, incorporate it more into your system, M mindfully, especially mindfully. During the course of Building Safety Anchors, I help you to identify and mindfully practice what brings you to safety. That is absolutely essential for you, for therapy clients, in order to build safety. So building safety anchors helps you identify different methods, different ways to bring yourself to safety, but also how to mindfully experience them and build that capacity to actually stay in your safety state. And then over time, the need decreases, in general, I think, to do something like smelling an orange, or being with someone to get out of the house. The need for that should decrease over time. And BSA is not supposed to be a replacement for therapy, but it can help to reduce defensive feelings by increasing feelings of safety. And if you can practice this every day, uh, or just maybe even, even weekly, just some, if you just practice it, the need to do a grounding skill should decrease over time. So we got to look at the process of safety versus safety medicine. Process of safety versus safety medicine. I'm going to 
give you a reframe here. This is for uh, therapists, my therapeers. So with our clients, we want to frame this stuff as a process of building the capacity to self-regulate. Safety cues are not medicine. It is not a dose of something to get you through the moment. I mean, it is, yeah, but overall, it's more than that. It is a process to build the capacity to self-regulate. It's not a pill that we take to feel better. I mean, I keep catching myself. It, yes, it can be, but ideally it's something that we build over time. And when I'm talking about the process of safety, it's more than just coping with the present moment. It's more than just applying a cue of safety medicine. It's, it's a long, it's a process. We got to build, we have to exercise the capacity to feel safe. I had a session uh, with a teen client. She came in in a pretty panicked state. Uh, wasn't able to talk about why and didn't want to talk about why, actually. She said, no, I'm not going to go and do it. It's like, okay, fine. So we just have to deal with the present moment and the panicky feelings. No, no problem solving, nothing like that. We just got to deal with the somatic pieces of this stuff. So what I did was I had fidgets ready to go. I have some fidgets in my office. I had nature on the screen, like I mentioned before. Usually I'll have, in session, I'll have um, something I find on YouTube of like aerial fly over of a beach or for this session in particular, I had this 10 hour video on YouTube of uh, forest scenes and it would change every eh, 10 minutes or so maybe to a different scene or different location in the forest. So we had the nature scene on, we had fidgets. I was checking in with her about her breathing consist consistently through the session. I was checking in with her about her present moment sensations that she was having in her body in the session. So it was all these things that I was doing with her to help her ground herself in safety. We also, as she was looking at the screen with the nature, I would prompt her and say, how do you feel about this? And she would look at it and I would say, if you were there, what, were you, what would you be up to right now? And she would share, use her imagination to say what she'd be up to and who was there with her. And as the scene changed, I would ask her, in this scene, like, how do you feel about this one? And who, who's there with you now? And so we would use her imagination. We'd use the physical fidgeting. We would use breath check-ins, consciously slowing down breathing when we were able to. All these different things to help her to ground herself in safety. So we had things that could work in the moment. Any of those pieces can be helpful in the moment of a panic attack. But we also had all these pieces that could be taken and practiced on and developed further. Like she could take these pieces and develop them further on her own, practice them at home or even in class. You can do deep breathing in class. You can notice your somatic sensations in class. During this whole process, we were noticing the process of accessing safety. It's, it's a long process. It's not all at once. It's not like I gave her her safety cue medicine and she was good. No, it was a process. For us, it was a, I think it was a 60 minute session. And over that whole hour, we were able to see what helped her to feel more or less safe. And that's just for that hour. But over the weeks of her being at my client in therapy, she was able to see week after week what helped her to, to come to safety, stay in safety. And she was able to see, oh, my defensive, panicky, anxious feelings are decreasing week after week after week. This growth is often missed, but it needs to be talked about in therapy. In therapy, we should be checking in about goals, how things are going, how are our, our, our symptoms reduced or increased, stay the same, whatever it is. We should be looking at these things and tracking our progress in therapy. So week after week, we can see a long process, hopefully, or maybe even a short one, of getting more and more self-regulation. So when it comes to the process of safety versus safety medicine, safety medicine is like, here's your cue of safety and hopefully it'll help you out. But the process of safety is there's teaching involved. 
there is developing safety, and there is experiencing safety. So in session, we can teach about these things. We can teach about fidgets in session. We can experience safety through fidgeting in session. And we can send somebody home with homework to develop their safety sensations through fidgets they might have at home or becoming curious about and identifying new things at home that can help them to feel safety. So it's not just one thing, it's an ongoing thing that needs to be taught by us. We help them, we guide them in experiencing a session with their feedback and then making adjustments as we need to. And then giving homework, so it's this longer process of safety. And the whole time you're, or they are mindfully experiencing, our clients are mindfully experiencing safety and what that feels like. And when they share it with us, it makes it more real. And that's kind of how I put it. It's not just in their mind. It's not just in their body, but now they're actually sharing it out loud with a trusted person, uh, ourselves or us as their therapist. And that just kind of makes it more real. And when you share something like that and you get somebody else who understands or is listening, taking you seriously, can, can have empathy for you, and they take your feelings and your thoughts and your sensations seriously, and they validate them and they normalize them and they encourage them, that's a much different experience than you get elsewhere outside of therapy. That mindfulness and the sharing it with somebody, I think is a big part of the process of building safety and not just receiving safety medicine, safety cue medicine. Building Safety Anchors incorporates all these elements into it. Over the course of the course, I'm guiding people, I'm teaching, I'm assigning practice, ideally daily practice. I'm given a little bit of homework through journaling, if, if that's an optional thing, but there are some journal prompts there. There's opportunities for reflection through journaling. There's mindful noticing and experiencing. So all of these elements are in building safety anchors. You can find that again on justinlmft.com. I hope this is helpful, Christian, for you and dear listener, fellow stuck now. I hope this is helpful for you as well in your therapy practice or if you're a client, just for you and thinking about what helps you come to safety. Is it a thing that you're trying to do to like turn safety on or is it a process that you're trying to unfold and become curious about that journey, that process of becoming more and more grounded in your safety state? Thank you once again for listening. Do me a favor and follow or subscribe on whatever platform you are on. Bye. This podcast is not therapy, not intended to be therapy or be a replacement for therapy. Nothing in this creates or indicates a therapeutic relationship. Please consult with your therapist or seek for one in your area if you're experiencing mental health symptoms. Nothing in this podcast should be construed to be specific life advice. It is for educational and entertainment purposes only. More resources are available in the description of this episode and in the footer of justinlmft.com.